Father, again, we thank you for today, Lord. As we sang earlier, Lord, we, we love your presence. We love you, Jesus. And so, Lord, I pray that as we sit now underneath your teaching, Lord, that you would feel our love for you. And Lord, I pray that we would enjoy your presence, that we would feel you in a mighty way, that we know that you are with us, that it is your words going forth. And Lord, I pray that to be true as well. Lord, and let nothing pass from my lips that's not from you. And so, Lord, we yield to your spirit now. We give you our attention and our hearts. And we are just so grateful, Lord, that you love us enough to spend this kind of time, this personal time with us. So, we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Open with me to Mark chapter 5. Pick up in verse 21 today. Mark 5, verse 21. Let's just read that first verse. It says, Now when Jesus had crossed over again by boat to the other side, a great multitude gathered to him, and he was by the sea. Now if you remember last week, Jesus had just performed um, a very successful exorcism. Um, and the exorcism was of a, a non-Jewish person. It was a Gentile region there on the eastern side. Of the, of, the, of, the, of the sea it was the demoniac as he is often addressed and uh, if you weren't here last week I encourage you to go listen to that message the Lord had a lot to say to us and in our passage today Jesus returns to the other side the, the Jewish side of the sea and as we often see as he steps out of the boat that there's a large crowd waiting for him and so let's pick up verse 22 and behold, one of the rulers of the synagogue came, Jairus by name, and when he saw him, he fell at his feet and begged him earnestly, saying, My little daughter lies at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her that she may be healed and she will live. So Jesus went with him and a great multitude followed him and thronged him. We meet this individual, Jairus, and immediately in verse 25, we meet another individual. Let's just meet her as well. Verse 25, now a certain woman had a flow of blood for 12 years and had suffered many things from many physicians. She had spent all that she had and was no better, but rather grew worse. When she heard about Jesus, she came behind him in the crowd and touched his garment. For she said, if only I may touch his clothes, I shall be made well. Now, both these individuals that we've just met, Jairus and this unnamed woman they're both individuals in need and yet the contrast between these two people couldn't be more striking the difference between these two reveals just how great and how wide the love and the mercy of the Lord is and I really hope that that's the message that everyone walks away with from this portion of scripture is that God's love goes to extents, to distances that we really can't fathom. But we'll never really move outside of that unless we choose to. And this man, Jairus, he was an important synagogue officer. And this woman, and I don't mean to be cruel, but she pretty much was a, an anonymous nobody. And yet Jesus welcomed and helped them both. Now Jairus was about to lose a daughter, we find, who had, been given, who had given him 12 years of happiness. And the woman was about to lose to an affliction that brought her 12 years of sorrow. Jairus' daughter had spent 12 years living, and this woman had spent 12 years dying. Now, as an officer of the synagogue, Jairus would have likely been wealthy. We don't know that for sure, but it's likely. But his wealth could not save his dying daughter. This woman now, we find, is bankrupt, having given all that she had to doctors that could not cure her. But regardless of their status in the world, they both found the answers to their needs at the feet of Jesus. And knowing as much as we do about the Lord, is knowing everything that the Word tells us about Him and His promises, I would suggest that that's a great place to start, not a great place to end. 
If you end there, then God bless you. But if you start there, I think the blessings come a lot sooner, a lot faster. It just tends to be our habit to wait, to wait until everything else is exhausted, and then when we're exhausted, to find ourselves at the feet of Jesus. But I would encourage us all to begin there. So this woman, she reaches out, and she manages to touch Jesus. Let's pick up in verse 29. Immediately, the fountain of her blood was dried up, and she felt in her body that she was healed of the affliction. And Jesus, immediately knowing in himself that power had gone out of him, turned around in the crowd who touched and, and said, Who touched my clothes? But his disciples said to him, You see the multitude thronging you, and you say, Who touched me? And he looked around to see her who had done this thing. But the woman, fearing and trembling, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. And he said to her daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your affliction. Now notice, this situation with the woman comes in the midst of a journey of Jesus to the home of Jairus. And we can imagine that the presence of the crowd would have been an irritation to Jairus. He would have likely looked upon these people as a hindrance to his travel home to the great need of his daughter. One woman in the crowd is singled out by these gospel writers. And the woman, we've been told, suffered from some kind of hemorrhage for 12 years. And to add insult to injury, this woman was also subjected to trem tremendous social pressures. We may not think about that. We just think about her medical condition. But the nature of this woman's illness fell under the stipulations of Leviticus chapter 15, whereby she would have been pronounced unclean. And as such, all these years, she was an outcast from everybody around her. She couldn't take part in any religious observance, nor could she have any public contact with any, without defiling those that she touched. There may have even been the chance she was married and lost her husband due to this situation. Now, like Jairus, this unnamed woman had heard that Jesus was back in their region. Remember, he crossed back over the sea, and he set out to find relief through this power that he has. Now, conditioned, I'm thinking, by her long-term rejection and all the isolation that she suffered, she wasn't going to approach Jesus for a miracle. Her physical contact would defile all that she touched. Remember that. The best she could hope for was some kind of secret healing. After she was healed, the woman probably began to shrink back into the faceless mob that were pushing and shoving for a look at Jesus. The great disappointment of Jairus came about when Jesus stopped. As he was on a march to his own home. And it would seem for an instant the crowd was perfectly silent. That's how I kind of picture it. And they expectedly waited to hear what Jesus would say, but they could not believe it when he questioned, who touched my garments? Everybody was touching, pushing, shoving, and grabbing at Jesus. Why would he ask such a question? How could he ask such a question? Well, I know a couple things to be true. Jesus wasn't ignorant of what happened. He had not, didn't need to be told that he had been touched this miracle was not stolen from Jesus. And we need to understand that as we read this story. As a matter of fact, when he looked up, what did he say? He looked for her that touched him. He already knew who it was because he was omniscient. Jesus knew the need of the woman before she ever put forth her hand to his garment. And knowing her faith, his power was granted for her healing. So why then did Jesus ask this question? More than this, why did Jesus stop at such a critical time to ask that question? Well, surely Jesus knew the importance of time. But maybe some of the reasons he stopped, let's just consider a couple. Possibly, our Lord delayed in order to give the woman the opportunity to give testimony of her healing. That's why we yield and we let the body praise the Lord for the things that he's doing so we can all join in that great occurrence for whoever has that story to tell we can have the testimony of the lord's goodness so important the testimony go forth now possibly our lord stopped in order to correct any misconceptions on the part of the woman 
that maybe she had stolen healing, that maybe there was some superstition about magic in her mind where she, she took this, you know, she was responsible for that. And we know from Jesus that in part she was because her faith made her well. Another possible reason, maybe this was just a gracious act of our Lord to make it publicly known that this woman had been made whole so that she was no longer to be considered ceremonially unclean. That would be like the Lord, to let everybody know she's now clean. You can associate with her. She can touch you again. Because the people probably would have been a little bit taken back if they'd considered the fact that she had pushed through that crowd, touched so many of them, to take that off of their shoulders that they would not consider themselves unclean at this point. And possibly, and perhaps most significantly, this delay of Jesus resulted in even greater miracles and greater faith on the part of Jairus. For now, the young girl, his daughter, was not simply sick. She was dead. So upon this woman's confession of faith, the Lord Jesus sent her off with these words. He said, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your affliction. Now I think it's interesting, those two words right there, be healed. And when you look into the definition of the Greek that's used there, the first definition is be thou. Be thou healed. And then it goes on in that definition, agree. Give thyself wholly to. And I think that's such an important part. That you be thou healed. That you would walk out in that faith. I've, you've come forward and you said, I believe the Lord wants me to be healed. I'm asking for prayer for healing. And then you walk away from that event. Be thou healed. You know, there's a lot to be said in the word about being double-minded. About lacking faith. Jesus corrects his men so many times about lacking faith. And I've brought this up before. And this is one of those places that people become uncomfortable And I've said it to you half-jokingly, that if you ever want to really get a Christian off balance, if you want to see their ire raise up, challenge their faith. No one likes their faith to be challenged. Don't tell me I don't have enough faith. And yet, the men that Jesus was surrounded by were continuously taken to task for their lack of faith. And so I think that that puts us in pretty good company. And I don't think there's anything wrong with us being challenged on our faith. Although we need to do that if we do so with the guidance of the Lord. Don't let that just be your decision. That I'm going to challenge somebody's faith. That's not your decision. That would be a leading of the Lord. And if you can't do it with love, keep your mouth shut. Because so many people have been been offended to the point of backing out of their walk with the Lord. Because someone challenged their faith in an unloving way. That challenge needs to come with an encouragement to have faith, consider the goodness of the Lord, taste and see. Pick up in verse 35. While Jesus was still speaking, some came from the ruler of the synagogue's house who said, your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? As soon as Jesus heard the word that was spoken, he said to the ruler of the synagogue, do not be afraid, only believe. Jairus' heart must have sank when he heard these words. Wouldn't any of us? I mean, I wonder if he thought, I knew this was taking too long. I knew Jesus shouldn't have wasted his time on this silly woman. Now the situation is beyond hope. Now I know none of you ever think like that. But let's be honest, how often do we come to that point where we think the Lord tarried when he should have acted quicker or he didn't answer a prayer when we feel he should have? Jesus knows all and all shall be done in his timing and everything that is done and even held back for a period is done for our good. So the Lord graciously reassures Jairus, do not be afraid, only believe. Now, Jairus 
was being told two things by Jesus. The first thing, stop being afraid. And it almost sounds cruel for Jesus to say this to a man who just lost his daughter. But Jesus knew that fear and faith don't go together. Before Jairus could really trust Jesus, he had to determine to put fear away. Sometimes that is so hard. But we need to recognize that very often, I would say most often, our fear is it's not from the Lord. Now, only place really in relation to the Lord that our fear is welcomed is to be to have fear of the Lord, understanding that He is a consuming fire. But most of the times when we're fearing the circumstances of our life or the things that have come against us or the tragedies that sometimes befall us in this world, fear is what raises up. And that's the enemy's toll to take our focus off the things of God. Now, the second thing Jesus was telling Jairus, only believe. Now, this word believe here, it means to entrust, especially one's spiritual well-being to the Lord. To commit, to put trust in. Those are all action words. Those are all verbs. He's telling him, do not be afraid and believe. Put your trust in me. Now, there are times that we need to put our trust in him, not knowing what he believes is best for us. We don't put him, our trust in him only when we're going to get the result that we desire. That's the hard part. We put our trust in him knowing that whatever the answer to our prayer is, it's the best for us. And that may be the complete opposite of what we've asked for. We may ask for healing and not get it. We may, we may ask for all kinds of things and not see that. And we may never understand how God could possibly think that that was better for us. Because we can't see the whole picture. We don't have God's eyes. We don't have God's hearts or his thoughts. We don't see, we don't see the beginning from the end, but he does. And so believing in him is not just believing in him for the answer that we desire. It's believing in him no matter the answer that comes. That's the hard part. But that's why we need to know him so well. That's why we need to strengthen our personal relationship with him. So that we trust him so much that when he speaks even something opposite of what our hearts want, that we know it's best. We know it's best. And that really puts us in the position of a child. Childlike faith. Not blind faith, childlike faith. And that's where we really need to lean on God the Father. To understand that He is a loving Father and His desires for us are nothing but good. Nothing but good. So He's saying, listen, don't try to believe and be afraid at the same time. Don't try to believe and figure it all out. Don't try to believe and make sense of the delay. Instead, and I think the more important word here, only believe. That is the only right response. Only believe. We could spend all day on the definition of believe, but I think right now the more important word there is only. Only believe, because if I only believe, then I've left out all the other thoughts that might come all the other things that may seep in. He's saying simply, just believe. Believe in what? Believe in Him. Where's our faith to be in Him? In Him and Him alone. You know, when we consider faith, which is such a, a massive topic, I mean, it's been one of those topics for me that I've studied and studied and studied we always come to the one verse in particular, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. And it's, and it's one of those verses that I've tried to reword a hundred different ways that I might understand it better myself and explain it more clearly. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. 
And I get excited when the Lord gives me this verse for wherever I'm teaching because it's one more opportunity to see if I can figure it out. And I feel like I'm closer every time. Listen to that verse from the Amplified Version of the Bible. Listen. Faith shows the reality of what we hoped for. It is the evidence of things we cannot see. I really like that. Because some will say you cannot see faith. And I don't agree with that. You may not see the object of faith, but it is the faith itself that is the evidence of the things believed in and waited for. Sometimes when I've read that verse, I would think, okay, it's the faith of substance. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. So hoped for, that puts things out there somewhere. Evidence of things not seen. And so I'm standing next to the person that has the faith in something right now, and I'm trying to look with them. Like, where is that thing you're hoping for? Where, where is that evidence? And the truth is, where are you going to see the faith? It's not out there, it's here. The evidence of what's hoped for, the evidence of what's not seen yet is in the person's response. That's where our faith comes alive. That's where it's witnessed is when we can stand in the midst of whatever is happening and have faith. Faith in the Lord that he's working even though I cannot see him. Takes us to that verse about our hope being an anchor. The only time that an anchor is doing its job is when you can't see it. And it's the same with, with the faith. I can't see the things I'm hoping for. But you can see the evidence and the faith in how I wait for it. What I tell people about the Lord that's working those things out. About how truly I am willing to accept whatever he decides best for me. That's faith. And I'm not expressing this in some way that you would think I'm saying this is easy. But I do know because God's said so that it's possible. It's possible to have that kind of faith. Jairus needed to believe the words that Jesus was speaking. His faith would show the reality of what he hoped for and be the evidence of what he could not yet see. Everything else told Jairus that the situation was hopeless. But the words of Jesus brought hope. Notice what I said there. Everything else told Jairus that the situation was hopeless. Then what do you do with everything else? It's not to be considered, only believe. We're to put away all the doubts. We're to put away all the filters through which we consider things. We're to put away the best we can, the voices that are speaking into us, that are telling us otherwise. Jesus is saying, only believe. And he's saying, believe in me. Believe in me. Did I not come for you? Did I not choose you before the foundations of the world? Did I not love you so much that I came to die a horrendous death that you might be rescued from sin and the grave? Those are the things we need to contemplate, to think about, to have ready in our hearts when those things raise up against us that would challenge our faith. Where there is life, there is hope. Where there is Jesus, there is hope. And with God, we must also believe where there is death, there is hope as well. He said to her, your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? Trouble the teacher any further. Let me assure you this morning, you will not trouble your teacher. You will not trouble your Lord to come to him with whatever heart you might have. He never tires of our approach. He never tires of our requests. And I know there are some that say, well, I'm not going to beg the Lord. If it's in your heart to beg, then beg. If you're as desperate enough to beg him, then be desperate enough to beg him. I don't see him correcting anybody. You come to him with the earnest request of your heart. You come in to his presence, believing in him and that he has the best for you waiting. 
and you just lay your heart out however it is wired and he will receive you he will receive what you have to say as I've often said go to the Psalms if you don't believe that you can't be honest with God David made it very clear along with the other psalmists you can be honest with God I would say do it with respect after all this is God you're speaking to sometimes we're a bit casual but bring him your heart because the truth is you can try to tuck it away you can try to dress it up put some perfume on it God already knows what your heart is and so to come with a heart that is whatever and then you present him one that you think he'll like better who are you fooling we're not fooling anybody but ourselves he doesn't wait for us to come in a particular way look at verse 37 it says, and Jesus permitted no one to follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. Then he came to the house of the ruler of the synagogue and saw a tumult and those who wept and wailed loudly. So leaving the crowd with his disciples, except these three, Jesus continues on to the home of the deceased daughter. These are those inner three that Jesus always had with him. I don't think they were anything special. I think they just couldn't be left out of his sight. Now outside the home, the commotion that we read about here was typical of Near Eastern funerals. Even today, if you see a, a tragedy befall people in the Middle East and you see the way that they, that they mourn, you see the, the outward expression, it almost seems over the top because we're all stoic Western people. We're not going to do that. But in this case, these were professionals. You ever looking for a job field? Professional mourners. And because he was a leader in the synagogue, there was probably many. They're paid. Now, there was actually a law in that time that you had to have at least one. You had to put money away for the casket and for the mourner. But in this case, there were probably several. And by the looks here, there were, were many. Now, the Lord informs the mourners that all their carrying on was unnecessary. I like that. Why? Because the girl was asleep. Now, we could do a deep study into the words asleep. We were told that this woman, this young gal had died. It says asleep here. Why did it say asleep? Because that's the word that the Lord chose. And it says in verse 39, when he came in, he said to them, why make this commotion and weep? The child is not dead, but sleeping. Now, Jesus wasn't out of touch with reality when he said that. And he wasn't pretending. He said this because he knew a higher reality. A spiritual reality that was more certain and powerful than death itself. Look at verse 40. And they ridiculed him. But when he had put them all outside, he took the father and the mother of the child and those who were with him and entered where the child was lying. Now, thinking that Jesus was either naive or completely self-deceived, the professional mourners mocked and ridiculed him by their laughter. They believed they knew death when they saw it. And such unbelief will never witness the power of God. So these people were put outside. Only the Lord, the inner three, Peter, James, and John, and the parents went to where the girl's body had been laid. Jesus would have nothing to do with these people who failed to believe his promises. He drove them out so they would not discourage the faith of Jairus. Verse 41. Then he took the child by the hand and he said to her, Talitha kumi, which is translated little girl, I say to you, arise. Immediately the girl rose and walked, for she was 12 years of age, and they were overcome with great amazement. The phrase that he spoke there was in this language of Aramaic. Sometimes there's questions, what language did Jesus speak? Well, the common language of the known world at the time was Greek. The language they would have grown up with in their homes was Hebrew. And then Aramaic was a common second language in that region, so which language did Jesus speak? I'd say probably all three. 
depending upon his audience. But I would look at this and I would say this actual event was both simple and sweet. With a couple of softly spoken words, the Lord took the young girl by the hand, lifted her up so that she began to walk about. Jesus spoke to a dead girl as if she was alive, and he did this because he is God. And God who gives life to the dead calls those things which do not exist as though they did. Romans chapter 4 verse 17. Jesus spoke to this girl with the power of God and she was raised from the dead and they were overcome with great amazement as all of us would be. The relatives were stunned and doubtless they were delirious with joy. But you know, Jesus asks us to look beyond such works to even greater things. In John's Gospel, chapter 5, verses 28 and 9 There he said, do not marvel at this. For the hour is coming in which all who are in the graves will hear his voice and come forth. Those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. And so we see this one case, and there were others, of Jesus raising a single person from the dead. And yet the greater thing that we must consider and know that is coming probably soon, is that day where he will raise all, both those who believed and those who didn't, some into his presence for the rest of eternity, and some to condemnation. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, beginning verse 20, it tells us there, Christ is risen from the dead, and he has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since by man came death, by man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ all shall be made alive. What a great promise. When we marvel at such things, when we consider those of our loved ones that have gone on to already be with him, those that will all be raised together into his presence, he was the first fruits of that resurrection from the tomb. It's a great promise for the future. So as we begin to close Take note that Jesus didn't fail Jairus. See, I always hesitate to say we're closing. Because people shift and Bibles get closed. I'm going to just make it a surprise from now on. Or maybe when you shift, I'll just go longer. But think about it. Jesus didn't fail Jairus at all. And he didn't fail the woman who needed healing. And in ministering to both, he highlighted the faith of the woman and stretched the faith of Jairus extra far. And remember, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. You know, if you go through the books, the book of Acts, there's this progression that takes place with the word of God. In the sixth chapter of Acts, we see the word of God increased. In the twelfth chapter of Acts, we see the word of God grew and multiplied. In the nineteenth chapter of Acts, the word of God grew mightily and prevailed. Well, our faith, like the word that is its source, should be progressive as well. Because our faith should increase. And our faith should grow and multiply. And our faith should grow mightily and prevail. If the word can have that kind of progression, and it's the source of our faith, then our faith should have the same reaction. But it takes some work on our part. You know, like the word, our faith from its infancy must grow to become a dominating force. And I think that should be a desire in our heart. That whatever our faith is today, it's not sufficient. And you can say, well, that's, that's kind of cold. I'm not, I'm not here to judge, but if I judge by the word of God, then I would think that our faith can increase. I think that's something we need to, to allow, to ask for, to become part of. Because I think if we went around the room this morning, 
that we could all look at something even recent and go, yeah, my, my faith there probably wasn't very strong. I, I don't even think I prayed about that. You know, I, I want the kind of faith that Jesus is offering. I want it to be only that. To only believe. I, I, I don't like the times I'm in doubt. Do you? I, I don't like the things that filter my faith in God. I don't like the, the things that, that get whispered in my ear by the enemy that make me faint or fade or fall away from the things that God is doing. I want to just believe, only believe. What a great place that would be. I mean, could you imagine? Okay, I'm not going to set too high of a bar. Just imagine getting up tomorrow morning. Tomorrow morning. Monday, your favorite day. Monday morning. And you go to bed tomorrow night. And all you did all day, only believe. One day. Okay, try it for an hour. But do you see what I'm saying? I've been saying it now for weeks. There's more. There's more to our walk. There's more to experiencing the Lord. There's more faith to be had. There's more of his love to experience. There's more of his presence to walk into. There's more of the word to discover. And if it's by the word that my faith comes, then why wouldn't I be in there if more faith is what I want? And remember, I always caution, make sure that you're not putting faith in faith. Sometimes we get that game going in our head. If I only had more faith, and so we try to conjure that up, and then I feel good about where my faith is at. So now I'm standing beside myself having faith in my faith. That's not what this is talking about. I'm not supposed to be suddenly impressed with my faith. I don't nail it to the wall or put it on the shelf in a trophy case. That's not what this is about. My faith is in the Lord. And that's something I can't really stand beside and observe. I'm in that. That's from me to him it's the spirit of God in me speaking of who he is and when I understand that and I understand him and I understand his goodness when I've tasted and seen that my faith can really only increase the final verse here 43 but Jesus commanded them strictly that no one should know it and said that something should be given her to eat do you see how not distant this Lord of ours is? I mean, just the personal touch. The little girl just came back from the dead, and he's like, feed her. Feed her. Having grown up in a Jewish family, that was the answer to everything. Just eat some food. Okay, I'll eat some food. But I'm not hungry, just eat. Okay, I'll eat. But the Lord forbid those that were present from publicizing the miracle. Why? Because Jesus wasn't interested in the popular praise of the masses. That's one reason. The other reason is he was resolute to press on to the cross. Because it's that which he came to do. Now, we shouldn't overlook these closing words of this chapter. He said that something should be given to this girl to eat. And you know, in ministry, this would be known as follow-up work. Souls that have known the surge of new life need to be fed. One way a disciple can manifest his love for the Savior is by feeding his sheep. Jesus said, if you love me, feed and tend my sheep. And so all of us that have been walking with the Lord for a while have the responsibility to feed those younger sheep or newer sheep, however you want to phrase that. Those that are young in the Lord need to be fed. And discipleship is surely waning in our times. There should be a lot more discipleship. But what a gift. One more thing that you can do. If you love the Lord, feed his sheep. And how can you do that? I mean, you don't get up here every Sunday and teach, right? 
but you do teach along the way. And how do you teach along the way? You share God's word. You know the promises of God. And when you talk to someone who's in this situation or that situation, you're able to say to them, you know what the Lord says about that? You know what God promised for you? When you do that, you're teaching. You're feeding the sheep. And now if you've been walking with the Lord for some time, and you would look at yourself and yourself a mature sheep, then you should be self-feeding. Now it's always good if you have someone mentoring you no matter where you're at in your walk with the Lord, but that's not always the case. And so as you journey, there becomes a time where you're responsible for your own feeding. You come and you sit under a teacher's teaching and you're fed that way. But do you only eat on Sundays? I bet not. I bet you eat every day. A couple times a day at least. So why would you only feed on the Word of God Sunday and Wednesday night, or for a lot of you just want Sundays? We need to be those that are completely, continuously filling ourselves. Because I think we just discovered that's where our faith grows. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. And so if you feel today, and I'll just come from my own confession, and I say, Lord, heal my unbelief. Increase my faith. I don't think I'll ever get up a day in my life and not want that. Well, there's only one way to have that happen, and that's to feed on the Word of God. Because then that's where my faith stands. That's the firm foundation upon which it stands. That's how I can express to you I have faith. Why? Because of Jesus. What about Jesus? Well, what he said, what he did, his witness. So be encouraged this morning. There's, there's plenty to do. You're still here. So there's plenty to do with your own walk before the Lord. And then he'll take that walk and he'll turn it into a beautiful ministry down the, work, the road. He'll use that ambition of yours for his word. Ask him to increase your faith if you think that's your need this morning. He will. And then walk that out. Be thou. Be thou. What a cool thing. Just like when we speak about the filling of the Holy Spirit within us. The actual translation of the Greek, be being filled. That's a continuous process. It's not to be, oops, I'm empty. It's like, oh, I'm being filled. Because I'm asking, seeking, receiving. He only wants good for us. The world wants the opposite. The enemy will tell us over and over again that God doesn't want good things for us. But he does. And yes, the pains of this life, they stack up. They wear us down. They're burdens on our shoulders. And even there, Jesus says, my burden is light. Cast those concerns on me. And so take them up on that. Because he asked you to. go into our communion time now as we close and I just encourage you as you take the cup as you take the bread just just let him fill your heart with joy ushers and come up worship just let him fill your heart with joy this morning You may have to make some room for that. Sometimes we don't have joy because everything else is pushing it out of the way. Sometimes we're like, why am I not more joyful? And I think the Lord would say, well, you know, clean up that room and I'll come in. Get, get that stuff out of my way. And so ask him to take that stuff that's blocking your joy. Ask him to show you what those things are that you might just dump them that you might put those burdens upon him whose burden is light. And then just find that joy. Determine to be joyful. Because God loves you. Hopefully each of you that I'm speaking to knows that joy because you're sons and daughters of the Most High. And if that's not your case this morning, then that's a decision you need to make as well. 
Because all of these things are just words. You've never made that commitment. And so today is the day of salvation. So make that commitment. And for those of you that know the Lord, then just spend this time. That's what he wanted us to do. As often as you do this, remember me, he said. So remember him this morning in your prayers, in his presence with us now. Father, we thank you for your word, for your presence, for your love. Lord, just for the work that I believe you so desire to do in each of us. Lord, to make that relationship we have with you even more personal, even closer. That we would see your presence every moment. That we would know our strength comes from you. That our strength is in the joy of the Lord. Lord, make us joyful. So tough in this world. But that's because we're looking at the world and not you. And so, Lord, I feel you're telling us this morning, only believe. Do not fear. Only believe. And so, Lord, help us to believe. Help our unbelief. We're so thankful. We love you. And we're thankful that you loved us first. In Jesus' name.